From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Vic Carson, Johnny. State Unity Life. Oh, what's in your mind, Vic? Got a job for you if you're interested. I just received a report from our agent in Venice. That... Venice? Oh, I'd love it. Soft nights along the canals. Venice, California, Johnny. Uh, okay, what is it? Murder. Bernard Slade, age 56, Penny Arcade operator in Ocean Park. That's right... Right next door to Venice. Go on. Well, the body was found in living quarters at the rear of an arcade in the amusement zone. Killer unknown. And? Barney Slade must have been quite a movie fan. The police found his apartment plastered with photographs of the movie greats. Silent screen vintage, that is. At least a dozen of them were of Mavis Gale, a real queen in her day. Yeah, the vamp type, I know. Oh? Oh, it's just a vague recollection, you understand. Yeah. Well, the police also reported that somebody, the killer probably, had drawn a big question mark in red crayon over each of Mavis Gale's photographs. Interesting. If it means anything. We think it does, Johnny. Especially since Mavis Gale is named as the beneficiary in Bernard Slade's insurance policy. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Silent Queen matter. Expense account item one, $210.65. Plane, cab, fare, and incidentals to Ocean Park, California. As soon as I checked in at my hotel, I got in touch with Homicide. Sergeant McKay, they said, would probably be down at the pier. I saved you cab fare on this one, Vic. It was a beautiful moonlit night at the beach. A warm breeze was blowing in from the Pacific. And besides, it was only a three-minute walk from my hotel to the fun zone. A gaudy array of neon and noise. An occasional whiff of salt air seeping through the aromatic blend of fried shrimp, hamburgers, and popcorn. Business was good, and the Penny Arcade had its share of it. I headed straight for the blonde sitting in the change booth. She looked tired and faded. Hi. Let me have a dime's worth of pennies, will you? A real plunger, huh? Oh, money means nothing to me. Well, here you are. Don't spend them all in one place. Well, you know, I might at that. This machine here looks mighty interesting. Lola the farmer's daughter. Oh, it's kind of racy. How's your blood pressure? Fine. Then try uh, that row along the wall over there. Uh-uh, that wouldn't do. How could we carry on a conversation if I was on the other side of the room? Who wants conversation? I do. Well, you don't look like the lonely type. Never can tell, though, can you? Look, you run along while I finish stacking these pennies, huh? No, seriously, uh, all I want is a few answers. Well, I got more than a few, honey. What's on your mind? Barney Slade. What about Barney? You work for him long? Who wants to know? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. I'd appreciate any information you can give me. Hey, your company dropped a bundle on Barney, huh? Well, that remains to be seen. Oh, Bonnie was a nice guy. Nice as they come. What do you want to know? Oh, we'll just start anywhere. You want to know about his friends? <laughs> well, maybe after what happened to him, you'd better tell me about his enemies. He didn't have none. Not one. Oh, must have been quite a fellow. He was, mister. Okay, let's get back to his friends then. <laughs> just about everybody along the pier. Anyone in particular? Oh, Frank Jessup, for one, runs a concession just down the way. Go on. Uh, Sam Hegstrom owns a fishing boat. Then there's, uh, Gus Kanakos, Irv Goldstein. Like I said, Barney had a lot of friends. Including you? Including me. How about Mavis Gale? I don't know the dame. Well, she, uh, she used to be in the movies, uh, the silent kind. Oh, I heard about her, only I never met her. Didn't she ever come around? I never saw her. Did Barney ever talk about her? Not to me, he didn't. Why? Why what? Why should Barney talk about Mavis Gale? Oh, I, I just thought he might have mentioned her sometime or other. Uh, is that the door to Barney's apartment back there? Yeah, that's right. Mind if I have a look around? That'd be up to Sergeant McKay. Well, look, if he comes in, tell him where I am, will you? Tell him yourself. He's back there in Barney's apartment now. 
I walked on back and took note of the heavy padlock dangling open on the door leading into Barney Slade's apartment. The small living room was empty, yet it was crowded, too. Crowded with memories of the silent greats. Nazimova, Valentino, Pickford, and Fairbanks, me and Swanson, the Gish girls, Lon Chaney, and all dozens more. Their photographs filling practically every inch of wall space. Mavis Gale was there, too, a big question mark in red crayon drawn over each of her photos. I moved through a narrow kitchen. The back door was wide open. I stepped outside. Who are you? Oh, Johnny Dollar. You must be Sergeant McKay. That's right. Yeah, your office said you'd be here browsing around. So I'm browsing. There's something bothering you, Sergeant? Murder always bothers me. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like those photos in there of Mavis Gale and the question marks on all of them. And that bothers me. You think the killer did it? Could be. Let's go back inside. All right. Or maybe Barney, huh? Maybe Barney what? I'm talking about the question marks. Could be. Pictures belong to him. Yeah. Yeah, he had quite a gallery here. Looks to me, though, that some are missing. That's so? <laughs> Why, you know so, Sergeant. The wallpaper isn't faded as badly where they used to be. And there are a lot of tack marks, too. Okay, so who took them down? Barney? He could have. So could the killer. That's right. Have you found anybody who could tell you anything about him? The missing photographs? Not yet. Hey, Barty, keep a lot of money in here. Twyla didn't seem to think so. Twyla? Twyla James. Blonde out front at the change booth. Oh, yeah. Barney was sort of particular about his apartment. Never let anybody in as far as she knows, not even his friends. Huh. Wonder why. According to Twyla, he seldom used the arcade entrance. Preferred to use the back door. Is that the one the killer used? It was standing wide open when the body was found. Well, who found it, by the way? Twyla. When she showed up for work yesterday, the arcade was closed up, so she went around back. Do you know when Barney was killed? Doc figures around 3 a.m. Two slugs from a 38. One would have been enough. Any signs of a struggle? Yeah. Lamp over there was on the floor. That chair was turned over, and this table had been upset. Pipes, medicine bottles, pillboxes scattered around. Uh-huh. Heavy bolt and chain on the inside of both doors. Barney didn't have to let a visitor in unless he wanted to. That's right. Of course, he could have run into the killer outside somewhere. Sure he could. Only you don't think so. Unless Barney was in the habit of walking in his sleep. Oh? Uh-huh. When we came in and found Barney, he was in pajamas and bathrobe. The wall bed over there had been pulled out and was mussed up. So it figures he was probably asleep when the killer tapped on his door. He got up and let him in. Yet according to Twilight... The place was off limits, even to his friends. But she wasn't around all the time and didn't know all his friends. He found some others? I'd like to find one of them in particular. A man Barney referred to as the preacher. Just the preacher? No name? No. At least Sam Hexstrom couldn't remember. And this uh, preacher, was he allowed into Barney's inner sanctum? Sam's pretty sure he saw the two of them come out the back door one night, a little more than a week ago. Other times, he spotted them taking a late evening stroll along the oceanfront walk. Mm-hmm. Did Sam ever talk with this preacher? No. But he got curious after a while. Ask Barney about it. Barney said the man was a very old and dear friend. Let it go at that. And you haven't been able to find out anything more about him, huh? I'm still checking. Well, it would sure be a break if you could locate this preacher. He might be able to tell us something about those missing photographs, what they were. It might also explain why the killer took them. Have you seen enough in here, Dollar? Oh, yeah, sure, I guess so, Sergeant. Hey, tell me... What does Mavis Gale have to say about all this? I only got to talk with her just a couple hours ago when she returned from Palm Springs. She was pretty upset when I told her about the crayon marks on her photographs. (laughs) But naturally, she couldn't offer any explanation. None. How did she react to the news of Slade's death? Tears and such? She's supposed to weep about it? Why not? Bonnie Slade must have been a pretty good friend of hers. After all, he named her as the beneficiary in his insurance policy. Oh... That's interesting. Why? When I talked with Mavis Gale, she told me she never heard of Barney Slade. Expense account item two and three. One dollar and ten cents. Phone call and cab fare. The call was to Mavis Gale's home in Bel Air. The butler said if it was important, I could find her at McCartney's mortuary in Venice. 
cab fare to Venice via what is laughingly called the Speedway, a one-way alley lined with backyards and garbage cans. It took us less than a minute to cross over into Venice, a boom that had busted. A melancholy mixture of old broken-down buildings and the sound of the sea. Crumbling bridges, moss-covered canals, of paved streets wandering disconsolately into sand dunes and ending where the money gave out. A dream that had kind of died of a broken heart. Good evening, sir. Oh, uh, Bernard Slade, please. Oh, yes. Mr. Slade is in the slumber room at the end of the hall. Is anyone with him? Oh, indeed. Quite a number of his friends. Would you know Mavis Gale if you saw her? The silent screen star. Well, indeed I would. At least I think I would. She was one of my favorites. Uh, she, uh, she hasn't shown yet. No, I, I... You mean she's expected? So I understand. Well, well, that's nice. Oh, that is nice. I didn't know she was a friend of Mr. Slade's. Oh, you know most of Barney's friends, huh? I know most of the people along the pier, and they were all his friends. Well, how about one called the Preacher? The Preacher? Mm -hmm. Well, naturally, I'm very well acquainted with many men of the cloth. And if you could tell me his name... I don't know it. Oh. Look, you have a visitor's register here, don't you? In each of the slumber rooms, yes. Just inside the door. Oh, thanks. Uh, well, where did you say Mr. Slade was? Down the hall. Last room on the left. The room was crowded with friends who'd come to pay their respects to Bernard Slade. I eased over to the visitor's register and gave it a fast rundown. There was nothing to indicate that a minister was among the mourners present. Then I heard the hall door creak open. And there she was, Mavis Gale. Certainly not at all what I expected a vamp of the silent screen to look like 30 years later. Slender, trim, and a smartly tailored suit. And even more attractive than the photographs I'd seen of her in Barney's apartment. She moved down the center aisle to the casket and stood there for a moment. As I walked toward her, she suddenly turned, her eyes wide and staring, her lips moving silently. Then she crumbled to the floor. I understand you've been trying to reach me, Dollar. That's right, Sergeant. Okay, what's up? I got some news for you. Mavis Gale was once married to a small-time movie actor named Tom Sanford. Seems he was murdered during a hunting trip in the Sierra some 27 years ago. So? So now it turns out he wasn't. Mavis Gale just identified Barney Slade as Tom Sanford. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a stagecoach ride. I get some lumps, and a surprise witness turns up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Adrian John Doe, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.